Well, hello, and welcome to Work Cookie, a weekly gathering of IOs, HRs, recruiters, and a few actors as we try to make the world of work just a little bit better. And today, Jeremy, we're going to go down the path of building resilient teams, strategies for thriving in uncertain times. Uh, we definitely are uncertain times. <laughs> Seems we've been stuck here for a few years. Uh, so hopefully you've got some great advice because teams are struggling. Teams are, everyone's just trying to make it through. But I can imagine, especially with organizations, teams must be having a hard time. Yeah, I was looking through and we've got some excellent, um, we've got six references today with some really good, good information, really good advice and really good study findings. And I was thinking about this. There's a couple of good sports analogies I was thinking of, but when you look at it, maybe they're not the best because you might have a, you might have an underdog team and they have to be resilient, you know, they come from the back and going to the playoffs, et cetera. But when you're looking at organizations, you're not really playing against anyone. You're, you're playing against yourself. So if you have something to prove, it's it's just a it's a completely different dynamic. It's almost like you're you know your your team stranded on an island. You're not fighting. You're not you're not trying to beat and perform better than another team stranded on a different island, unless you're in a reality show. So it's a it's a it's a different dynamic. But there's a, I'll start off with some interesting things as a runway to get us started. Some of the things that came out of these studies, which uh, have been uploaded to the chat here and will be uploaded to the show notes, regardless of the platform you're uh, taking us in on. And uh, of course, these are open mic. If you're listening, you can always be here, come chat, hang out with us and be a contributor on the podcast. So a couple, couple bullet points. Uh, there was a study that found that teams who regularly debrief after challenges outperform those who don't. That comes as a, okay, well, duh, but how many, really how many organizations do that and how many teams do that? Because usually it's just, okay, we're on to the next fire that we need to put out. Uh, there's another study that looked at this, this whole debriefing aspect of it. And even when there's a challenge, if it didn't go bad, you should still do the whole debrief. I started to think of like your elite military forces, right. what they, how they train, how they uh, go into depth and do all these debriefs, and why aren't organ, you know, and organizations might consider doing something that is similarly. Here's another article looking at okay, companies should invest in training programs looking at these different things like cognitive resilience. There's behavioral resilience and there's contextual resilience, but developing, helping their employees through actual training, develop skills and things like environmental scanning, sense making, uh, strategic foresight, these things that are really critical because of, you need to recognize what's going on you, interpret these changes in these particular envi environment. And I'll leave off with a little definition of those three things I mentioned. So you have cognitive resilience, which are the mental processes that help us interpret and respond to change. The behavioral resilience, those are the actions, even routines that enable us to get closer to effective responses. And then also contextual resilience is really that supportive environment. There's a lot of the study results that showed the environment is key and those relationships that foster resilience within the organization that is key. So what's being done on the on a day-to-day -day basis to build build a stronger team? You mentioned training though, but where should organizations get training? I mean, I've I've, I've related this story before, but you know, I've been with organizations where Joe down the hall took a workshop. They actually sent him to take a workshop. They love the workshop so much, but they're not going to actually hire the trainer. They're going to get Joe to go through his handout and he's going to spend the next hour and a half reading his notes from the workshop. And there's very little benefit in that. As far as that train, and you make a good point. So that some might say, at least that's being done. And maybe that's a decent place at least to start, but with any organizational initiative, it's how do you keep it from being checked the box? We talk about this all the time. How do you make it purposeful? Maybe they say, okay, Joe, you go and take copious notes. You take all your your information, and then it's maybe all right. Let's you know work with our L and D department to put something together that really sticks. Of course, make sure that you're not stealing intellectual property, that kind of stuff. So I'll make a little little note on that. 
but really make it something that's purposeful. Make sure that there's supervisor support for whoever's going through the training so that you have this thing called three-person teaching where the person that is being trained actually has some kind of a learning partner and they, their learning partner can be a colleague that isn't going through the training. Uh, it could be a, a mentee, for example, it could be a mentor or it could be their supervisor, but make sure that that supervisor support goes after the fact. So what happens after the training? Two months, three months, four months, six months. With organizational change, six months is the usual minimum, as is with training, about continuing to have those touch points with it. And how can you start to make those things actionable? Do you do, you do um, uh, you know, hypothetical scenarios? Uh, are there case studies that are done? And then you get the group of people that are in the training and go over the case studies. Do you take some kind? Do you make some kind of a template for resilience and strategic agility, which is another thing that's mentioned in these in these articles, most all of them, this this aspect of agility to define different types of agility and make some kind of a, an SOP, some kind of a checklist. But how do you take whatever is being learned and how do you make it live and thrive throughout your team and ho hopefully when all goes well throughout the the, the entire company? How is an IO going to help me to build a resilient team? I mean, I've already got my team. I'm hoping they're resilient, but, you know, my advice would be toughen up. <laughs> Maybe not a good, good right. advice. That's not bad advice, Tom. <laughs> toughen up. So that's the thing. So depending on – so each IO has a different niche area and a different uh, particular practice area. But most all IOs, if you have an IO or if you're looking to hire an IO, look at one that might come in and, and work with some kind of assessment to say, okay, here's the baseline, here's where we're at, and here's what's going on. Here's the, the type of resilience that we're displaying. Here's the type of group cohesion that we have. There's all kinds of assessments. There's AMP assessments. There's personality assessments. There's one for role clarity, et cetera, burnout. There's an assessment for pretty much anything. But an IO will go in there and say, okay, here's what we're looking at. Here's what we can hypothesize based on this data that we have. Therefore, we know this is actual the, the kind of training or coaching or team cohesion strategy that we actually need to work through. Because it may be found that there might be chronic stressors within a team that's slowly eroding the team cohesion. And of course, if you're looking for resilience, you want to go the opposite way. So those chronic stressors might have to be dealt with first and looking at and collecting even uh, having an IO go in and just create some basic surveys or go and talk to people specifically and collect some qualitative feedback. There's the minimum and then there's the maximum and somewhere in there is like what's actually effective to be done here. And we know just with going back to chronic stressors, just in the human body, teams and our bodies are, we're really more able to handle big every now and then stressful events. But the chronic things that, the chronic stress is what really breaks our body down. And a chronic stress, it's the same with teams. That's what can can really break teams down. And that's just one way that an IO might come in and, and, and help in that matter. Thank you very much for that. Uh, let's put a lead. He has no stress. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I can, I, just to, to tack onto a couple of things that Jeremy said, the. Uh, you know, when there is some form of a crisis, you know, we hope that we plan for it, right? You know, you you, you fight how you train, you know, you 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 prepare for the war, you know, and hope for the best, you know. But the 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 post mortem, you know, the, is is so important. And you know, like Jeremy said, you know, in, in the military, anytime you have a mission, there's an after action report. Or, or what we call a hot wash, where everybody gets together and they say, what worked? What didn't? You know, what could we do differently next time? Um, you know, some groups do it with a, a, a start, stop, continue. What should we start doing? What should we stop doing? And what should we continue doing when you finish, when you go through these situations? Or, you know, and, and we used to do it with the Boy Scouts, and we called it thorns and roses. You know, what's the good things? What's the bad things? But those are so important and to actually, you know, make sure that you are, you know, 
taking notes and make and, and doing action. I mean, that's really what it comes down to is the action on it for the future. Um, because I mean, you, did you actually learn anything if all you did is take notes and then you put it in the drawer and you never think about it again? Well, you'll think about it again when it happens again, because it's going to happen again. Um, you know, and sometimes those those things that you figure out will prevent it from happening again. So, you know, that's very important. Um, and then moving on to the to the training, to, to your point, Tom, a lot of times th- there is a difference in training options. You know, if I'm going to send Bob to, to go do a thing so that he can come back and teach us that thing, well, then I need to really look at what I am sending him to do. There's a difference between a participant class and, a, and an instructor class. And I mean, when you send when you send a, someone to, to, you know, to the university you, and they're going to be an English teacher, they don't just take English classes. They take classes on how to teach English. And it's the same thing in the training realm. You can do a train the trainer. You can send someone to there. It's going to cost you more, of course. Then you get the actual tools to teach that to others as opposed to, well, I took the class, you know, I mean, and and because we can't just assume that they understand, you know, uh, you know, learning theory and all these things. And are they going to become an expert and all that stuff? No, absolutely not. But they can at least gain the tools to teach that particular thing. Uh, and if you're going to have them do this, especially on down the road, it's, it could be worth the investment. If it's a one time deal. Just hire a consultant to come in and do it. You know, really. I mean, it's going to cost you less. But can you talk a little bit about um, the post mortem? Because you know, in the world of theater, we quite often will do a post mortem after the show, and you want to make sure it's constructive and not just let's do some finger pointing for the next two hours. So, how do you lead a post mortem successfully? Well, I mean, you you gotta. You, it's often helpful to set and agree on some ground rules. You know, if there's not already an established process, you know, to say, okay, look, you know, we, we get it. It sucked. We did, we got through it. There may be some complaints and that's okay. But, you know, here's, here's going to be our framework for that. And they, and you can find frameworks. I mean, they're listed out there. There are books, there's, there's websites. I mean, there's, you know, there are brilliant people in this room right now that I'm sure could give you a framework right now. That you go through and say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to go around the room, and we're going to give everybody their time. And and it's, and what you're going to have to do as a facilitator is you're going to have to head people off. Yeah. You are going to have to facilitate. You can't just let it become because it's just going to become a gripe session, and you don't want that. So when somebody starts pointing fingers or whatever, you're going to have to cut. You're going to have to have the, the strength, I guess, to actually stop that and go, okay, you know, I, I, I hear you and, and, you know, and I understand where you're going, but how can we, what constructive can we get from that? And then you have to work on actions. You know, what happened? What did we do? What could we have done? What would we like to do better next time? And if you focus on the facts and not so much the feelings, you know, I mean, the feelings are important, but that's not the venue. So you you really want to focus and and you want to do it. You want to do it close enough to the event that everything's still fresh, but not so close that the emotions are raw. Yeah. So you got to and you're going to and that's going to be different for every team. You got to really judge your team and, and how they react to these things. So. But you really want to make sure you have that framework. And this really does require someone who is is effective at team communication and to be able to actually facilitate uh, rather than just going, so, Bob, what do you think? And let him go. You know, oh, we can't call on, on you know, Jeff because Jeff complains all the time. You know, you, you can't. Uh, and, and also, um, you know, something that, uh, you know, I think it was Nelson Mandela talked about learning from his father. He sat in the circle of all the leaders and he said he let everyone talk first. Then he talked. Mm-hmm. And you have to do that. You have to, you know, you have to give them just the briefest of what we're doing. Here's our framework. Here's our ground rules. Here's what we're going to do. Okay, go. And then shut up and let people have their say other than if you have to redirect. And don't, don't lead them. Don't give them your opinions. Just let it go. And then as it goes around, when it comes back to you as a facilitator, then you make your observations because people, people are led. I mean, they're influenced. 
And they were like, oh, I was going to say this, but he said something else, and I don't want to get on the boss's bad side or something. You, you really can't do that. The nicest boss can still influence because, oh, I don't want I mean, I like this guy. I don't want him mad at me. Yeah. So you have to, you know, so speaking last is imperative to really be an effective facilitator on this because we all know anybody who's done any kind of a group or a survey or a poll, it's all about how you ask. You can make it say whatever you want. Resist the temptation. Thank you very much for that. Nick, let's go to you. Yeah, it's interesting to think about, you know, being able to train a skill like resilience because with so many communication skills and then the software skills, it's intangible. You don't have a thing to point and say, oh, that guy gets it or, oh, this team has the, the thing that we need. Um, and with something like resilience, experience is the greatest teacher. You almost have to go through crisis because it will bring the team together. Um, yes, I think there's there's ways to find people to not panic and keep a cool head and everything like that. Um, you know, and if you've got that, you hopefully have a healthy organization where communication and trust and psychological safety are already in place. Um, you know, Lee said you, you you fight like you practice or you practice like you, or you play like you practice. It's all that sort of thing. Like, these are extenuating circumstances that you can't plan for all of them. Um, you can only say, what do we do when things go wrong? And I think if you're talking about an organizational strategy, nobody wants to think about what's going to go wrong. But you almost have to open that door to say, OK, how am I going to react as a leader? What do I expect the organization to do? Are we going to go full like I, I give an order, you respond? Or are we going to huddle everybody up in the conference room and go, it's ugly. What do we need to do in the next 24, 48 week or, or things like that? Um, and it's going to look different for, for each organization and different leadership styles. Uh, but I think it does have to be part of the strategic conversation. And it is such a slippery thing to try and, and measure. Uh, it's out there, but it takes time and it takes kind of the right situations at times as well. Can you give me any examples of organizations that were actually ready, that they went through those processes, they they had a plan of action? I mean, we all got caught you know, with our pants down when the pandemic came along, but, you know, it had been 100 years so we weren't maybe ready for that but we have financial crises all the time <laughs> so, yeah i mean you, the, if you listen or listen to watch read the news it's, it's a scary world and the boogeyman's going to jump out of every corner um you know we don't talk about all the positives happening but that's a commentary for a different time um i know for me like i was working for a family restaurant pandemic hit it was i saw leadership go oh my goodness i have no idea what to do what are we going to do? What are we allowed to do? They took a beat. They huddled up and said, okay, here's what we're allowed to do. Here's what we're going to do. We rolled out to a to-go only model and they you know, were very upfront and saying, okay, we're going to have X amount of people in the building. We're going to do what we can to clean the building while we're you know, kind of shut down um, and make the best of a bad situation. Um, you know, Similar situation when one of the owners passed away suddenly. There was a, a pause, a let's take stock of the situation and then let's figure out what to do from there. So I think that that, that pause that, you know, you have the, that moment between what happens and how you react. And if you can train yourself to take that pause, deep breath, look at the situation and try and gain some clarity instead of just blurting out the first thing that comes to mind, um, that is tremendously difficult to do in conversation, let alone in crisis. Um, but I think that's definitely a skill that leaders should, you know, Again, take the beat. What's the best solution for the problem? Um, you know, it's cheesy a little bit to say, take a deep breath, but that's really what we need to do. And, you know, the longer the crisis, the deeper the breath, and the more often I uh, need to kind of take that pause and say, what is the next step? How are we going to get through again, whatever benchmark you're setting forward? And your next step might be call an IO psychologist <laughs> and bring them in. Thanks very much, Nick. Natasha, good to see you again. Let's go to you. All right. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I think, you know, just listening to the various comments that are being made, I agree that, you know, it is a little bit hard to measure for plan or plan for how to manage resilience um, in a crisis. Um, but because um, I think the comment was made earlier that, you know, 
crises. Sometimes you probably have to go through crises because crises do bind everyone. Um, for the most part, it is. Um, we all navigated COVID at the same time. And so it bind us and put us in the same box. However, we experienced COVID differently. For some, COVID main, meant I'm able to now work remotely from um, the Hamptons, from my, from my beach house in, in the Hamptons, um, and just enjoy this life. And for others, it meant my spouse just lost, my spouse who was the breadwinner of the household just lost their income. And my income that is a fraction of that is not enough to sustain this family. For another, it could have been, and I lost both my parents. And so while we were all in the situation, it's not a real binding because one employee cannot relate to the next and it was not an equitable, equitable um, experience for all. And I say this to say that crisis does not always bind um, people, but it is also inevitable. And I really like the concept of, you know, the three, the three um, methods, the three ways in which people um, can really work around this, the cognitive, the behavioral and co contextual that um, Jeremy brought up earlier. I think that as we continue to discuss the importance of bringing in an IO psychologist to, you know, guide employers through, I mean, organizations through, you know, crises and how to build that resilience. I think that the advantage of that, the plus side to that, is that an IO psychologist can really think about the cognitive, what is, and bring about the questions of, well, what has been previous experiences? What do we know about how different divisions, different groups of employees, we look at analytics of, you know, the makeup of our organization? How have different groups of people reacted to change or what are responses to surveys that have been done in the past about, you know, either that were done, conducted during a difficult time of the organization to kind of anticipate or know how do we prepare, who do we prepare, and what do we need to account for? But at the same time, again, going back to the fact that it's hard to measure because some people do rise and surprise you, um, you know, in the middle of a crisis. And I think that Understanding how people react gives you an ability to be able to forecast in terms of what these behaviors might or might not be. What do we prepare for? Who do we prepare? And then contextually is understanding that not, not all, every crisis is the same. And so people's reactions might vary and there's no way to really measure for that. And so I think that as it relates to, you know, planning for resilience, bringing in an IO psychologist pretty much helps organizations to really think about the human aspect of the business. Because oftentimes we place it on the bottom line, on the business side, but not understanding that, hey, remember when everyone in America was mad at Mitt Romney for saying the organizations are the people? Well, guess what? The organizations are the people. Because ultimately, if your people are not well, if your people are unable to hold it together to get the work done, guess what? The work is not getting done. And so, and organizations still till this day miss that mark. And so I think having the benefit of having an I, IO psychologist is really bringing back the human factor and helping organizations understand how you really need to prepare the people, train the people, but also 
create a foundation for that resiliency. It does not just come out of thin air. There is a foundation that needs to be to exist, and it's up to organizations to build that foundation. Thank you very much for that. Absolutely agree. Uh, Dr. Martha, hello. Let's go to you. Hello. Well, when it comes to building resilience, it's something that we really need to look at from a comprehensive approach. Whether we're looking at building resilience on a team level, organizational level, or even on an individual level, there's not going to be one best thing to do. When we build resilience, we may suggest or consider certain events or certain types of events, but really resilience is a foundation. It's something that ideally prepares us to survive anything and everything that is thrown our way, which is why it's so important to look at a a more of a comprehensive approach. We've already touched upon some good ideas from Tom's suggestion to toughen up. And incidentally, I've also heard a couple of other good alternatives, walk it off and rub some dirt on it. Those can work. But training, we've talked about training, right? The right training done properly, implemented and utilized over time, that will help with building that foundational resilience experiencing, planning, going through things. But you also have to consider what is the environment, the daily environment? What is the culture like? If there is an undercurrent of stressors within the organization or within the team, for example, then you can have all the training and all the meetings and all the drills But as I think it was Dr. Jeremy mentioned, it really wears down that resilience over time. So as hard as we may train and prepare, we have to take care of the basics so that all of the hard work is not being washed away as soon as it's done. Because no matter how well we prepare, it all comes down to that foundation of resilience that can then act as a act as a, a a solid foundation of resilience to anything and everything. Yes, we can prepare for certain things or certain types of events, but you just never know what's coming. I think most people did not expect the pandemic to happen. And I would say that many people when it did happen in in the lockdown begin to affect everybody, became became real for everybody. I think a lot of people were thinking two weeks back to normal, right? Nobody expected what the reality of that would be. So that's where that, that strong foundation comes in and things like organizational culture and the daily experiences at the workplace make a big, big difference because all of those things when put together are complementary as a comprehensive way of building true, true resilience that will help a team and individuals for many things. How do you convince an organization to be proactive though? Because, (laughs) you know, when it comes to crisis, all organizations all of a sudden find themselves in the middle of a crisis and then start thinking that we should have prepared for this, Um, but they haven't. So how do they even just take the first step Well, sometimes it does take um, an event or a crisis and they start thinking about it as they're reacting because now they they don't have a choice but to react. But a good way of having that conversation as an IO, for example, is to bring solid examples of what happens with other organizations, prepared versus not prepared. And oftentimes, it's the numbers that do the talking, right? It all comes down to money because an organization can claim to be considerate and thoughtful and mindful and care about these people and those people and this environment and that environment. 
But oftentimes, nothing is as meaningful to an organization, especially a for-profit organization, as the dollar amounts. So that can sometimes be a good way to present one's case of why it would behoove you as an organization to be a little bit more proactive. There you go. Thank you very much for that. Hello, Peter. Let's go to you. Hi, everyone. Um, this is a great conversation. I really appreciate everybody's um, you know, thoughtful perspectives and insights here. Um, sorry, my computer is giving me a, a, a little bit of problem here. Um, you know, thinking back to the pandemic as as an example that's still in front of all of us, um, I was you know running a, a, a small national consulting firm at that point, um, and uh, when it hit, of course, like everyone else, we were kind of taken aback. But I think about the way we dealt with it was um, more of a all hands on deck kind of team approach rather than me as CEO saying, okay, here's the five things we're going to do, go do them. And, you know, I had at least two reasons for doing that. One was um, I kind of recognized that, you know, I had a, a people from several different generations uh, working for me, uh, a lot of different levels of experience and uh, I guess, core resilience capabilities, if you will. And um, I felt it was really important to have kind of a crisis management team assembled, pulling from different parts of the firm so that we were you know, not only communicating, but all sort of supporting each other. Um, so there was that sort of culture type of aspect that I continue to feel was very, very um, critical to our coming through um, the initial crisis and then into the prolonged, long emergency successfully. But the other thing is, as a leader, um, I was not, I, I was uh, not naive enough to think I knew what to do. And very frankly, I, you know, I assembled a crisis management team because I needed their help figuring things out and getting their support. And, you know, I mentioned that because I think uh, we still have a lot of organizations, private, public, nonprofit, where when a crisis occurs or something uh, unexpected occurs, everyone's looking to the CEO or the, you know, the C-suite and saying, what do we do? And um, I think organizations can go a long way towards building their resilience muscles, if you will, uh, by, you know, having a much more engaged culture that, um, you know, brings their different people into these conversations, whether it's ahead of time or when a crisis actually hits or, you know, whatever. I, I just feel that you know, many of our organizations are still way, way too um, command and control uh, structured. And that can come back to bite them. Um, look at the firms that, you know, continue to insist that people come back to the office for only, frankly, the reason that the CEO likes it that way. And, you know, there's, there's no really great business reason, if you will for doing that. And I'm sure we all can point to examples of that. Uh, let me ask you, because, you know, organizations, your health and safety, they have evacuation procedures. They may even do evacuation drills, but nobody is preparing a document about crisis. Is mm -hmm. that the next step we, we need to take as organizations? I, I personally think that um, an organization that does, I mean, another way to look at that and this other work that I'm doing right now uh, for small, uh, working with uh, small businesses on uh, climate impact adaptation, mm -hmm. that really should probably be part of any business's uh, continuity of operations planning is to have an element that relates to things like um, extended business disruptions like 
you know, health health issues such as that. I mean, you know, I'm sure, and I'm no expert in various industries, I'm sure they have contingency planning in place for things like, you know, supplier disruptions and, and things like that. But, you know, COVID was, was unique because of the, you know, I mean, the vast, <laughs> the vast dimensions that it affected. And um, so, you know, that would be kind of my thinking is that, you know, if you're doing a continuity of operations planning process, don't forget, you know, people do have a short memory, and but we all probably keep reading that the next pandemic is essentially around the corner. So, um, and, you know, don't, I, I wouldn't assume we've learned as much as we think we have. Yeah. And, you know, it, we had COVID a decade before that. It was the SARS crisis. I'm hearing scientists now saying yeah, about every 10 years we'll have some form of pandemic. So maybe it's time we did put together some of those crisis documents. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Peter. Sure. Uh, Jeremy, back to you. How are we doing so far? Absolutely excellent, as always, Tom. I really, uh, I'm really glad for what what Peter said. I think you broke it down um, into very actionable and, and chunkable items and easy to think about. I really like what he said about crisis management teams. Most companies have clubs or committees. You've always got somebody who wants to. They want to be involved a little more and they want to do something together. I mean, a lot of companies even have their own version of like a Toastmasters group because they just want to get better at speaking. So they meet before work in a, in a conference room. How, how, how difficult would it be to identify some people who might want to start, start like a crisis management club at the very least to start to think about these things like resilience and agility? You know, there, there's ways to get it started where it doesn't have to be the biggest lift for the people in the company. And at the very least, right, you would want to have the CEO involved with that or at least get some some debriefs or have some interaction with that particular club. But there, it, it's just a starting point. It's a really good starting point. A lot of us think of resilience as a trait. You know, he's resilient. Uh, she's resilient. Be resilient. One of the takeaways, one of the biggest things I found from all these studies was how they look at it differently and they redefine it as more of a muscle, kind of like willpower as a muscle. Resilience can be a muscle that you can strengthen over time. Um, and there, uh, some of the authors redefine resilience as a form of challenged thriving, where individuals, teams, they grow stronger as they navigate difficulties. Watch any movie. And you have people that are lukewarm to each other in the beginning, and all of a sudden they're best friends at the end. I'm thinking of the Jurassic World series. After you're, you know, they're lukewarm at the end with each other, or they're even like put off by each other in the very end, say, I do not want to help you. And then after being chased by the Indominus Rex and surviving the pterodactyls taking down the planes, all of a sudden everyone's pretty close at the end. Even Tommy Boy, let's go back a little farther. Tommy Boy. You have uh, David Spade and Chris Farley who, you know, David Spade was pretty lukewarm, didn't like him. But at the end, they had to navigate that huge challenge of saving the company. And at the end, it's better. So watch any movie out there and you can see how that, how that might work. The authors define this a little bit as uh, growth trauma as well. So we have, uh, I'm sorry, growth through trauma. Again, how can we redefine resilience? so that we can see it a little differently and so that it's not, okay, it's totally detrimental. How can we add that growth into it? And they look at it as a, not a trait, but actually a dynamic process and not really an individual character characteristic, but kind of a collective phenomenon that happens with, with teams. So that's another one of the big thought points. And everything I'm mentioning, what I'm gonna go, what I'm just gonna go through quick because we, Almost every episode, Tom, we talk about how can we take the, this research and make it actionable and make it some kind of a blueprint. Look at articles, start it as a blueprint, table of contents, outline, and ask very specific questions. Are we doing this? Are we doing something like this? How purposeful is it? What would happen if we did? What would happen if we don't? Who could be involved? And just start to get this, this going. 
One of the important things with resilience training programs that's listed is enhancing problem solving capabilities under pressure. And that's a form of training for help to help people manage stress and become more adaptable. For some reason, I just got this picture okay, in my head. I'm guessing that if somebody put me in a tent and they had me do a series of math problems and I had to get a certain amount right within, say, five minutes, and, and it's hot in there and there's mosquitoes, so there's pressure, but there's also time pressure. I have to get a certain amount right or they take a, a hornet's nest and throw it in the tent with me. I'm going to guess that I'd probably get better <laughs> and better and better and better each time managing that particular stress. So we can see how it can really act. And we, if we think of resilience as a particular muscle, uh, and, and that's what they, they say, it's really a skill that can be learned and developed. Uh, now I'm thinking there's a, there was a, actually another study. So now there's a little cooperation between the studies. Um, social support was really big. So you can say how much social support do we have or perceived really how we look at it in terms of psychology studies, they look at perceived organizational justice, perceived social support, because sometimes it's hard to measure the actual, but we can measure through assessments what the perception is, but in fostering resilience. So there's a lot of, a lot of information here in terms of how important uh, the, the, the social networking is and the cross networking across silos. Let me see if there's any, yeah. So one study highlighted that organizations with strong cross-functional collaboration where information and resources flow freely across departments are better equipped to handle disruption. Again, it's another checklist item to say, are we doing this? How are we doing this? How freely does this information flow? What happens if we don't make it flow freely and how well could it prepare us if we do make it flow freely. We haven't talked about leadership uh, here today, which is kind of nice because it, it's usually we get stuck in the leadership because it's it's a big buzzword. Um, one of the parts of the research, research found that organizations with leaders who engage in visible and accessible leadership are more resilient. And it makes sense that that probably goes back to uh, the, 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 the social networking aspect of it, the strong strength community aspect of it. And uh, last last thing here that was mentioned, there's a lot that was mentioned. Last thing I'm making a note of, companies implementing a continuous risk assessment and otherwise continuously assess and update what's happening. What are our assumptions here and how can we be prepared for a wide range of potential disruptions? I think which echoes a lot of what um, everyone has been saying today, Tom. How do we get away from that siloing, though? Because there are leaders out there who that's the perfect scenario. I've got these employees in this silo, that employee in that silo, and they don't talk to each other so I can maintain control. I'm the only go-to person. And, and we can talk a lot about siloing eventually not working, especially in a situation like this. Um, but I do want to delve into leadership a little bit on like, What's the conversation we need to have with those leaders? Is it worth our time to have a conversation with a leader who thinks siloing is great because it gives them more power? So it's another reason to hire an IO. We've had, uh, you know, Dr. Uh, Deborah Peck, who I work with, who wrote Turning, Intu Turning Intuition into Science on Organizational Network Analysis. And we've had her on. We've got an episode somewhere in the 200 range with her. And another reason, right? Because you can do you can do a, an assessment, uh, an assessment looking at different data through surveys to find out where are the silos, what's the white space happening in organizations. So you have your organizational chart, but what's the white space? What's actually going on? Who are the main influencers? Who's talking to each other? Where are the bottlenecks? What what teams? Who are the bottlenecks within those particular teams? So let's get just to get past. I'm going to skip the question about the how do we get leaders to say we shouldn't have silos because I think that's for a bigger conversation. But how do you start to break down those silos? Uh, there's there's an interesting study. Uh, I think that oh my gosh, maybe the Solomon Ash experiment where they had the eagles and the rattlers. I know we talked about this probably years ago and we were on deep dive, Tom. This, <laughs> where you just just that 
having teams compete against each other. So one thing you can do is start to have mixers, right? Where you might have different project kickoffs where you have different, not just uh, one team, but you might have different teams involved. Cross training, job shadowing is always good. Start to drop the us versus them. Start to drop some of the labels. Organizations often work with not just particular departments, but even think of these organizations that have your satellite your satellite teams. They might have a team in New Mexico. Maybe they have a team in Canada. Maybe they have a team in Louisiana. How do you break down silos that might occur, same department, but different teams versus the location? So how do you, again, start to get these people together, working and talking with people that they didn't, that they wouldn't normally talk with? And again, that's for another, another uh, larger conversation, uh, but those are definitely things to look at. Well, thank you very much for that. Uh, Natasha, let's go back to you. Oh, she may have stepped away. Uh, we'll come back to Natasha in a second. Lee, let's go to she's you. Probably, she's probably at the beach. Nice. <laughs> Lee, you're Except not she was in the Hamptons. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If only we could all be there, right? The, um, you know, this is, this is another spot where we can take a page from the, the military. You know, most military organizations have, we call it COOP, you know, Contingency of Operations. And you have a plan. And does it cover everything? No, of course not. But you have a person who that's their job. And they they look at the options, they study the things, they look at the, you know, they, they look at previous events and how things, you know, uh, lessons learned and all that kind of stuff. And then they and then they come up with a plan. And then that plan is routed up through the chain of command and everybody gives their their opinions and whatever else. And um and, and then we kind of, and then we go from there. Okay, so what happens? So if the building burns down, how do we work tomorrow? You know, or you know, a tornado comes through. What do we do? You know, and you know, the organization that I that I work for, we have, you know, we work with the government, so we follow a lot of those things. But we also have, I mean, I'm part of our contingency team, and part of that is not even business related. So. Let's say this lo the local area I'm in, we have a tornado and it destroys an employee's house. Well, that's kind of a crisis, even though it's not necessarily the organization's crisis. It is it's still our concern because it's one of our people. And so we have resources for that. You know, we reach out. Are you OK? What can we do for you? You know, the, here are some resources that the company has. You know, maybe they can do a, uh, you know, a. a pre you know pre thing on their their pay or the, you know they have you know their grants and loans and you know we, we volunteer and we donate and all those kind of things so we take care of that member of our team when they are in crisis as well as with you know the contingency if something happens you know if the location that you're in gets some damage in some way loses power you know what do you do and so we figured those things out as how, you know, where can you work tomorrow if today you can't get to the office? And when you have that plan, you know, in those, you know, some of them are pretty, pretty general, but you can execute that plan and everybody has, you know, they flip open their notebook and go, okay, plan number 5C. All right, well, I'm going to go in the living room and plug in my laptop. Okay, we're good to go. And so that's, uh, you know, it's good to have at least that base. Because one of the biggest problems that you have, I mean, when you have a crisis, what happens? You know, fight, flight, freeze. If you don't have some form of plan, you are just going to react. And for a lot of people, that reaction is to freeze. You know, analysis paralysis is a thing. I don't know what to do, therefore I will do nothing. You know, that's why you get somebody gets out in the street and a car's coming, they go, ah, and they get run over because they freeze, because their brain doesn't have that already programmed in of what I do in that situation. So having that will can often be very beneficial. Now I want to loop this back to our, our topic today on on resilient teams. So we you know because we've talked to organization writ large or whatever, but when you get in a micro thing in your team, um and yes Jeremy, I'm going to touch on leadership here. So uh, when you get into your team, how do you build a resilient team? Well a team is a collection of individuals. So you have to, you know, as the leader or, you know, 
in, in name or just because you are, how do you do that? Well, part of that is, you know, things like transparency. You know, we all we all jump at the unknown, right? You know, you, the jump scare happened because we didn't know that guy was there. And he, so, but if I know that person's there, then it doesn't bother me, right? So we have to we have to be transparent. I mean, I tell my team all the time, you know, if unless I am expressly forbidden, I will tell you everything that I know about what's going on. Because then there are no surprises. Then my team knows what's coming. And if it's going to affect them, we talk about that. How is that going to affect you? You know, we recently got kind of surprised by, you know, we had some budget cuts and had to lay, lay out part of our team. Well, I mean, that's kind of a thing, right? That's kind of a crisis. And the people who were still there are like, am I on the second list? Is there another one coming? And so we had to we had to navigate those waters. And so we had to talk to people. We had to, all right. So, you know, and my my you know, my you know, sub, my team leads who were talking to their, you know, their teams, and we go, okay, look, let's talk this through. You know, what's going on? How are you feeling? What's you know, we're gonna communicate with you, we're gonna deal with this, we're gonna get through it, we're gonna we're gonna change processes because we have less people, we're gonna talk through all that. And so we had that communication and when we could gauge each person and how they were reacting. And then we know, does this person, oh, they're good. You know, as Dr. G said, they rub some dirt on it. They're good to go. Leave them alone. And then we're going to move over to this other guy who's kind of having a mini, a mini meltdown. Okay, so we need to talk through that. You know, do you need a little bit of time? Do you need to take the afternoon off? Um, if you need to talk to someone, here's our employee resource source line. You know, feel free to give them a call. Um, if you need to step away, just let us know so we don't, you know, we're not looking for you. You know, we, and you address those things, and that can help those people to build that resilience because they know that the team supports them and the team and the, the team leader supports them. And even if we've gone into a storm and I don't know what's going to happen, well, the captain and crew got it under control. We may do a little swishing around, but we're going to make it through the other side. And if you have that trust and you have that communication, that openness, it goes a long way to helping each individual with their resilience. But there may be some, you know, CEOs who are listening to this going, how much time does your committee spend looking at potential crises or preparing for things that might not happen? Well, I mean, I'm going to give the classic IO response. It depends. Because really, it comes down to things like, what is your industry? What is your environment? What is the economy doing? Are you in a place where there could be a weather event? You know, I mean, if you're in Tornado Alley, maybe your thing should have something for a tornado. If you're on the Gulf Coast, maybe you should have something about hurricanes. You know, uh, if you're out in like the, the West, you know, wildfires. You know, there are things that you need to probably kind of think about, but that that are going to be completely a different thing somewhere else. So, I mean, it really is going to depend on that. But if you do designate, I mean, it is a good idea. If, you're, if your company can, can uh, account for it to have a person that their job is crisis response. And then they can farm out things to, to you know, to the other people who are helping them that doesn't have to be a, a huge time commitment. You know, maybe they maybe they meet once a month, maybe they meet once a quarter. I mean, the group I'm with, we meet about once every month or two, and we meet for an hour and we talk through, well, here's what's coming up and here's our resources. And we go, okay, great. All right, team, one, two, three, break. And we go back to our, you know, regularly scheduled program. It doesn't have to be a huge amount of, well, let me, let me back up. When you start, it's going to be a commitment. When you start, you are already behind. You are going to have to catch up. There will be a significant investment on the front end. Once you have it established, then it's maintenance. You know, then it's lessons learned. Then it's, oh, this new thing. Oh, a pandemic. What are we going to do? This is going to happen again. So now what did we do last time? So now we can, you know, I think Nick said in the thing, you know, learning and application, two different things. That's where you bridge that is where you really look at that part. You know, especially up here, but I'm sure it's happening in the States as well. The snow day, you know, when you wake up in the morning and there's been so much snow, you can't get to work. And no organizations are very few that I know of actually, you know, established policy for snow days. 
Um, they just, you know, start at the beginning every time it happens. Well, I've worked with organizations that had snow day or other event days. And I tell you one thing, one thing that COVID did, uh, you know, did definitely uh, affect is for many organizations, there is no such thing as a snow day now. Mm. You got a laptop, you can sit in your easy chair and you can work anyway. Yeah. And, uh, you know, because when I was still in the military, we would go to, you know, when it was not safe to travel, we go to, you know, essential personnel only, which is like security and those people. Everybody else, okay, we'll see you, you know, hopefully tomorrow. Now, take your laptop when you leave. It's supposed to snow tonight. Be logged in by eight. There you go. Thank you very much. Jeremy, back to you. We say often, what happens if you don't, what happens if, ah, what happens if we train employees and they leave? And then the, the alternative is what happens if we don't train them and they stay? It's the same here. What happens if we prepare for a crisis and no crisis happens versus what happens if we don't prepare for a crisis and a crisis happens? On its face, it might not sound too bad. It might just be, ah, well, you know, when, when it comes, it comes. Until you paint the picture of what that looks like when a potential crisis could happen and how bad it could get and get people to actually feel how bad it can get, you're probably not going to get by and to, to do anything. Uh, another great day, as always, we have, I have an exciting announcement, but first, next week we have Inspiring Hope, Cultivating Optimism and Vision in Times of Turmoil. That'll be our next podcast episode. And so Deborah Colazzo and Marielle Rodriguez decided that they want to do something for CBOC that could speak to the Spanish speaking community. So we've launched CBOC Spanish. It's cboc.com slash Spanish. And what those two will be doing the, um, right now, if you go to cboc.com slash, slash Spanish, you'll be able to see an opt in subscribe form where you will get the con the CBOC Spanish content that comes out and they'll be they're looking to do a video podcast and some blogs some new letters so if you're interested in the content some of their content in Spanish there is that subscribe form on cboc.com/spanish thank you everyone today Tom let me ask you how did we do I think we did well but you know they're they're there's a question forming in my brain, um, and it's, you know, crisis, turmoil. We talk a lot about bringing an Iowa psychologist when these issues start to happen. But I'm starting to wonder, you know, if things are good and you've got a good organization, but you don't know why things are just working, should you bring in an Iowa psychologist to help you figure out why it's going so well so you can then continue to grow along those lines? Ooh, I've never even, that's an interesting question. Most companies won't. Most companies, I mean, who would? <laughs> who, who has a great day and says, hold on, let me think about why I'm having a great day. Does it hurt? No. Can those factors be identified and recognized? Yes. Can they become more sustainable? Yes. Can they create roadmaps to stay on those particular paths? with what the organization is doing right because i'm just going to guess that any company out there is going to have new people come in and when new people come in even a single person will change overall the culture of a company i'm going to guess that new people down the road will be in leadership positions i'll take a wild guess that there's going to be a new ceo so yeah having something to look back how have how here's how things have changed we don't like it what was happening when things are good? How can we take those and mesh them with best practices of today? That's a pretty good idea, Tom. That's a really good idea, Tom. Thanks. We'll we'll start another um, podcast or topic for the happy IO. There uh, you go. go. <laughs> well, with that, I think that's probably a pretty good place to wrap. So, Jeremy, if you want to count us out, we'll see everyone back here in seven days' time. Counting out in five, four, three, two, and one.